online delivery of uh, anyway i hope it's not being recorded eh? <laughs> yeah, you, not yeah. you are live live on youtube now huh? <laughs> now we are i'm missing my hometown kerala so much online okay, okay that's enough that's enough <laughs> right. sure. wait okay we are going live So Vijay, how many cases do you have? No, I have about five cases, but okay. uh, you know, a lot. Of, uh, there was a very wide topic to cover, yeah. So yes, lots yes. more uh, things to discuss, yeah. Yes. So we can we can go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, on behalf of all the members of uh, Ski, I welcome you to the fourth uh, roundtable. Uh, ski webinar which is a case based discussion uh, today's topic what we have is uh, early oa knee management you know all of us uh, know that knee replacement is the gold standard for any arthroplasty surgeon but this seminar will bring out everything except knee replacement in the management of oa so you know most of the time we have arthroplasty meetings we do discuss knee replacement for two days together but this one you now vijay has put together early oa knee management which includes non surgical options and surgical options like osteotomy and others so vijay is today's uh, speaker and the moderator and we have a uh, host of panelists today we have uh, raju ishwaran jacob sachin uh, we have alankar we have bhushan sharan patil we also have uh, kanchan bhattacharya for the first time from calcutta uh, we have adarsh reddy we have mukesh clement and vikas so over to you vijay so we'll start uh, this uh, thanks very much parag so um, i think it's a great opportunity for all of us uh, to do some learning in these uh, tough times really so um, this presentation i like the outset i like to say uh, we work as a team so um, uh, that's myself doing arthroplasty work dr clement joseph uh, the team would do arthroscopy and sports medicine and kumar would do deformity correction yeah so some of the cases uh, you know we do combined work yeah so i think this is the most apt topic for a ski or the city of knee surgeons of india because you know as we all know you know when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail so in 2020 we have only a, a hammer like if we just do tgrs or if we just do unis or htos then you are not able to address the entire spectrum and i think a lot of units are falling short in that because they don't have the repertoire of uh, offering all that is available today in 2020 So today we have need much more instruments than just a hammer to manage knee OA. I think, and of course, um, many of you may not know, but the common classification that we use, uh, the Kellogg Lorentz, is described in uh, 1957. So nearly 60, 70 years of the classification, we use the same. Probably it's time for a new one, but nevertheless, we'll be using the same in this uh, today's discussion as well. But what has changed in 2020 is that our understanding of the pathophysiology of OA. we now understand much more than uh, what we used to few years ago and our rheumatology colleague tell us uh, that is actually inflammatory disease and we must actually call it as uh, osteoarthrosis and not uh, osteoarthritis so fascinating things about pathophysiology we are now beginning to understand about oa and thereby the management also changes so what is even more fascinating is that uh, the oa now is believed to be a driver of other chronic diseases just like you know the microbiome of these an interest <laughs> driving chronic diseases like diabetes alzheimer etc you know low grade oa may also be a driver of many of the chronic conditions so again is fascinating so what really boils down to it today is that uh, how we look at oa differently is that we now are able to recognize different phenotypes yes yeah. so you have the age related one that been there all while but now we have a cartilage uh, phenotype a metabolic phenotype a synovitis driven inflammatory uh, phenotype etc and therefore we find that probably you know our management is also tailored so my question to the panel would be you try to differentiate the different phenotypes today or you put all in the same basket um i mean uh, any other panel who has can take it on yeah okay uh, take up yeah i think you want to differentiate or you want to uh, sort of put everything in the same basket I think definitely inflammatory and non-inflammatory. You want to change. 
Yeah. We, know, we know that any arthritis is going to make it inflammatory because the degradation products is going to cause further issues. So you want to stop that, that primary inflammatory pathway to damage the rest of it. So you want to probably block even the primary arthritic patients from further damage. So you mean the cyanobitis different. So what do you do for them? I have to look in terms of some biologics if I can't find a cause or use disease modifying drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, or, or you refer them to a rheumatologist. Yeah. Maybe it's not in our thing. So certainly we got to recognize these subtypes now more and more. And the, the other one, of course, is the metabolic type, which is, uh, I think we have to recognize um, uh, as uh, uh, Senevate is driven or the inflammatory type is important to recognize. The metabolic today is also important to recognize. Typically, when a patient comes with, you know, back pain, knee pain, uh, ankle pain, all pain, and just because they have knee pain, they get a TKR and they end up far worse than they are. I'm sure you all agree with that. Yeah. So they are the metabolic type. But probably TKR is not the option, yeah. So we still don't have any uh, definite test to identify which uh, particular phenotype is it, although there are a lot of works going on. In future, we may have more objective tests to find out what they are. So in 2020, to conclude, OA is a disease process and not a condition, and it's a continuum in evolution, and we need to tailor a treatment depending on which stage you see the, the, the patient and what type of phenotype it is. So we need horses for courses. And you know, you can't be a one-trick pony today in 2020. A few years ago, probably a one-trick pony would have sufficed, but not now. So this is my first patient. She's uh, uh, 58 years old. She has left knee pain for four months, described anterior and middle joint pain, severe pain on walking, and some rest pain, full range of movement. She's 85 kilos, no comorbidities, has seen the local GP. And this is the first ortho consult. She just comes to see you the first time. Uh, Sanchan, you want to take that? Those so are the x-rays. So this is the first time. And yes. x-rays don't look, don't look too bad. She's well, low yeah. overweight. Uh, yeah. I would keep on conservative management, uh, activity management, weight reduction, strengthening of the muscles. And first of all, what you just mentioned, exclude any inflammatory or metabolic causes. Taking that those are not there, taking that those are not there, um, I will keep her on... Uh, on this uh, uh, conservative yeah. border management. And in today's context, I have a closer look at her vitamin D and uh, uh, calcium content as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so for the junior colleagues, uh, exactly what uh, Kanjan said. And, but surprisingly, this patient was offered uh, TKR in four different hospitals, actually, uh, before she came to see me. So a big no-no for any kind of arthroplasty or any surgery, first time. And uh, you have to manage them conservatively. No question about that, yeah. So we'll take each one a little uh, more. So what about exercise and physio? Does anyone have a strong opinion about it? It works, it doesn't work. So, so I will always advise exercise and physiotherapy. It definitely works. There is a lot of evidence to show that it does help, especially in Calgary Lawrence 1 and 2. It has a, a definitive role and we should always send them for physiotherapy. The question is, which kind of uh, uh, physical therapy is going to work? What modalities are going to work? Now, that is something uh, which we need to really see and discuss with our physiotherapists. Yeah, so probably one thing that doesn't work is this uh, interventional therapy and, uh, and ultrasonic treatment and all that. Right. They're probably a thing. But what really does work is a, a good exercise program, yeah. So we have put together uh, in our unit a knee school and the patients seem to be doing extremely well. Uh, just giving them a, a, a leaflet with the exercises to do and sending them off is certainly not the full. Sometimes, you know, it's more difficult to manage them conservatively than operating on them. So the exercise program has to be customized. It has to be modular. And you must document the uh, improvement. You must have some objective measure by which you show the patient that they're really improving. Like any other, you know, any other program like Cult Fit or something that you're going to, uh, you need to have more objective parameters. And there must be an active patient involvement. And they do very well. Group sessions are found to be extremely useful with that, yeah. So uh, evidence-based AOS recommendation, the one uh, model that's extremely useful in early OA is exercise program. A lot of us do uh, sort of ignore that or not give full effort to that, yeah. So I think for junior colleagues, you must really uh, give your time for this one. They've got the strongest evidence of all the modalities that we have that works very well. Absolutely. And also helps the flexibility, which itself is a big advantage. 
I mean, it's it's a difficult thing to say whether it will work completely, but it's always good to work on the toning of the muscles. Uh, the people who are heavier tend to have less activity, and people who are slipper will have more activity. It balances out in many ways. But I've not found it so easy to for making people to lose weight either. Uh, so definitely an advice I would give, but how effective it is, how measurable it is, is questionable. Uh, anyone has got strong opinions either way? Yes, Alanka. Yeah. So all my patients who are don't want to operate, I think they are not fit for surgery, especially young ladies. I give them no options. I tell them you have to lose weight. They go to a endocrinologist, and I also send, tell them that you will have to go to a bariatric surgeon. So there is evidence which says that for any symptomatic benefit out of weight loss, they have to have at least 10% weight loss of their body weight. Yeah, the uh, the commonly held opinion is uh, they cannot lose weight. That's true in end stage arthritis, but uh, where they cannot walk. But in early arthritis, they can all do uh, exercise very nicely. So when you're talking about early OA, uh, unlike uh, late OA, uh, you know, walking, for example, a lot of GPs especially advise against walking. Some other reasons as well. But now it's proven beyond doubt that low impact aerobic activity, like walking, immensely beneficial in many many ways. And diet intervention, of course, many beneficial, especially the metabolic type, etc. So early OA, I think, is a key to work on weight loss. We will not ignore that fact. Unlike late OA, where you know your weight loss may not work because they just can't exercise. It. You know, they just cannot exercise. It's so painful. Whereas here, you find that when they exercise, the pain actually goes down. It's a good uh, parameter for you to know whether you are dealing with early OA or late OA. Recommendation has been moderate on the AOS. What about uh, NSAIDs? Um, Raju? Yeah, so I uh, my first choice of pain relief pill would be paracetamol, 1000 milligram paracetamol or a combination of paracetamol and tramadol. And just uh, to add to your weight loss, the last uh, comment that you made, uh, it's perhaps got to do more with eating than with exercise. And I mean, exercise, it's published research in several platforms like the British Journal of Sports Medicine, etc. It just makes you live longer and healthier. But if your primary intention is to lose weight, you must get in touch with a good dietitian. And uh, this I can possibly even tell from my own personal example. I was more than 100 kilograms three years ago and uh, couldn't manage to lose anything uh, by just going to the gym and exercising. But when I consulted a dietitian, uh, the weight started to drop precipitously. So perhaps even end stage arthritic people who uh, can't possibly exercise in a pain-free manner. And I would like to recommend the aquatic exercise for them. Unfortunately, in Delhi, for six months, the swimming pools are closed, but you live in Chennai. Uh, swimming pools are open throughout the year. And maybe yeah. those who can't swim, they can probably walk in water. They moved on to NSAIDs. And NSAIDs, naproxen would be my choice. Yes, 500 milligrams or 250 milligrams, depending on patient weight. Anybody in the panel thinks you must not use NSAIDs? No, no. I, I, I feel we should always use NSAIDs because as a first line of treatment, they do help. But what I would not use is opioids. Sometimes, you know, people use uh, narcotics uh, and you know, that is something which we should avoid. You know, drugs like Daclofenac, uh, Naproxen, Ketorolac, uh, Paracetamol, uh, I would use them. And, uh, you know, our medical colleagues warn us against, uh, you know, uh, uh, renal, renal toxicity and uh, liver toxicity, etc. But use on a SOS basis, it's extremely helpful. And I think uh, you must not miss this step. A lot of people uh, give a course of one week. That's no good. Must have a long-term program, use it on a SOS basis. And I think it's extremely useful. And uh, the recommendation for this is very strong. The evidence is very strong. That is very, very helpful, yeah. So please do not skip this step. So, so what are the various options you have of NSAIDs apart from naproxen so and paracetamol? Rule about NSAIDs what do you that, use, Vijay? Uh, uh, rule about NSAIDs is that one patient may say naproxen works like magic. The next patient will say it's completely uh, useless. Yeah. So you've got to tailor it to the patient. And some of them are tolerant of something. The next patient is not tolerant. So it's very patient dependent. You've got to experiment and find out. But once you find something out, stick to that long term basis. Uh, SOS basis. Don't use too much. Don't overdose. An excellent modality to handle. Yeah. So we move on to supplements and nutraceuticals. Uh, so we have three types we have the glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM. We have turmeric that could come in, and then we have the uh, collagen peptides. So, Clement, 
what's your thoughts uh, yeah de- definitely the sk sports medicine recommendation uh, the turmeric is featured and also uh, for sports uh, cartilage injuries uh, there is a beneficial effect of uh, what is uh, boswellia uh, but i'm not sure uh, i would recommend uh, collagen uh, powders uh, even though they are marketed left and right by the pharma industries and Why glucosamine you? chondroitin sulfate i will stop using for uh, advanced ways maybe for a placebo effect i may give just to make the patient feel better no no this was the, no this is the patient who we talked about now so yeah. you know patient who had x rays you have seen okay so not talking about advanced oa this is the patient we are profile we are seeing and this is what uh, what you are advising yeah so you use curcumin yeah so anybody uh, have, yeah. any strong opinions for or against yeah don't use any of these i don't same here uh, don't use any of them which i have not had any conclusive evidence it works yeah so, certainly so uh, the evidence most probably it works like a placebo placebo so the real question sharan is that uh, as an addition to your exercise therapy it's, it's invaluable yeah so you just tell right. the patient that to exercise uh, yeah. you know as a placebo effect in combination with a good exercise program i think it's got a lot of value uh, so in that context i think uh, we can use it as a as a general I, principle uh, and the rtc have some uh, predetermined roles uh, so they cheap no side effects so why not so in Is my not- my experience vijay i have used this phyto medicines you know plant extracts something like this boswellia and all the rosiflex trio kind of medicines and they actually yeah, because, yeah. work they quite well the, you know the curcumin things will contain that so yes. so um, as a combination the exercise therapy not in isolation But the Absolutely. combination maybe it's a placebo effect but you can really harvest advantages when you use it correctly yeah the so, might have some anti inflammatory action as well that's right yeah so the the first group uh, reduces nsaid usage so at least you know some papers show weak evidence of that that's a useful thing uh, they could come in reduce inflammation so when you have inflammatory phase you know probably useful whereas the collagen is more for you know side injuries for the aging athlete probably you know so these things can be they're cheap easy to use probably placebo but still why not but it's cheap to um, argue against it yeah a glucosamine chondroitin sulfate combination has shown a lot of patients put on weight because of fluid retention and that is uh, quite uh, detrimental in the management of our in high doses so, in high doses yeah we don't so, got we don't get those high doses in india so if you uh, in high doses yes they can cause some diabetic issues as well they can cause some gastrointestinal effects as well but we are not they were high doses okay so we we'll move on to the uh, may i ask one question yes yes mukesh okay. uh, how many time how many days do you recommend all this i usually ask them to take for 3 months and then stop al- along with the other modalities all these nutraceutical supplements yeah that's right yeah so, so what's the duration months, you use it even 6 uh, months they can take okay. and then if you need to repeat the course you can repeat the course they are only uh, you know supplements yeah but uh, they do uh, reduce the need for nsaids and that's a good thing agreed so we'll move on to the uh, deloading brace so uh, uh, to their vikas use yeah. them in early this is the patient we're talking about the early yeah uh, aoa x rays that you saw in that elder female patient could mm-hmm. use it or not uh, i'll tell you about this patient it has been an acute phase pain for 4 months and uh, as i read it if i read it right 85 year old acute pain no 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 85 kg 85 kg 85 kg i'm sorry 50s yeah 5 kg in 50s so uh, the issue is that off loader base i could not find too much of varus in the knee that's one the second day is uh, that in this particular case i don't think off loader brace is really going to help because you did not specify it was a medial joint line pain only or it seem to me as if it was a global knee pain which is what we are discussing so how uh, would an offloader brace in a patient like this help it won't so uh, who else is there alankarya so in your practice when do you use this brace so i have used this brace only once or twice when the patient was like seriously comorbid morbid patient i did not want to operate on him so these are the indications when i would use offloader braces normal patients i would not use off loader braces because primarily one i don't think they work there is no evidence conclusive that they work and number two compliance of use with patients is like really poor patients don't use it beyond one year so who uses it a lot the panelists uh, who uses it a lot i i yeah, use uh, yeah clement uses it a lot anyone I, else i think it, it's I, a good i use it a lot yes 
Yeah. You I should use find it. out whether it works or it still you, will work or not. So, yeah, I, us, uh, so the patients who benefit uh, or uh, with the uh, virus who also have bone marrow edema, which is seen in MRI, these are the patients who really benefit uh, without a meniscal tear. Okay, there is a subchondral overloading. We have a lot of bone marrow edema in the tibial condyle, medial tibial condyle, or femoral condyle. These patients really uh, respond very well to unloading brace. If they don't want to wear a brace, I may even give a walker, ask them to do partial weight bearing or non weight bearing. Uh, just unload the knee for three to four weeks, they miraculously improve, especially the subchondral pain improves quite a bit in these patients. All you need to give a uh, rest for the bone to recover from the acute injury. So, so, two good, so basically, uh, like um, Jacob said, when you want to see whether, uh, so when you have more of an extra plate deformity, and then probably uh, it has some value there, uh, they don't want surgery, so instead of a HTO or as a trial for HTO, and as Clement said, uh, when they have bone marrow edema, these are good indications to, but the classical patient with a focal pain, they will not benefit from AOA. So it's a very narrow spectrum who benefits from this, but you must have it in your armamentarium. It's expensive is one thing. And, and if they have pain on, they have night pain, obviously not going to work. They have alignment issue, more extracular component. You may think of it, they've got a very narrow spectrum, but in those narrow spectrum, it has its role to play. Yeah, Vijay, would you make take a point that if you use these braces, there is a lot of inhibition of muscles, and uh, they, they, the muscles don't develop as nicely, and they, you find them, they're wasting their muscles over a period of time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So there's not a substitute to a good exercise program. In, in yeah. combination with that, uh, you can use that. Yeah. And there is, you know, there are people, uh, there's one physio from Ahmedabad who gives uh, braces for everyone. And that, of course, is a very wrong thing to do. Uh, hitting everybody with the same hammer. That's absolutely a wrong thing to do. But narrow spectrum of patients, provided you have a good access program, it's got a role to play. So Vijay, uh, just quickly, uh, the offloaders brace I don't use because as you rightly said, they're expensive. And secondly, you know, they require a lot of fitments where you have to have somebody who knows how to adjust those things. But I do use, you know, the regular hinged knee braces or a kneecap. And I've almost invariably, most of my patients are quite happy with it. You know, I don't know whether it has a placebo effect or Yeah, that I would think is a placebo effect. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, again, no harm in using that. The patient feels comfortable uh, by all means. Yes, and they have a yes. little bit proprioception as well, I think, with that. So, so I have completely moved away from this offload or expensive braces, but, you know, some hinged braces or knee caps. two indications. Braces, uh, uh, neoprene um, ones are quite good. Uh, uh, I totally take your point, but there's two indications of when they have bone marrow edema, and when you want to uh, uh, extra deformity, you want to offload and see how it works. Two indi good indications to use it. The other things are placebo, but a cheap placebo is always a good thing. Yeah. Because a placebo doesn't mean it's a bad. A cheap placebo is a great thing to use. Right, right, right. So what about lateral lateral heel wedge? Anybody uses it? Waste of time. No. Waste of time. No. Well, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, that's correct. But patients who have uh, foot deformities, and they have a heel valgus, for example, or they have a flat foot, then if you correct that, this may be secondary to the knee problem, or it would be a trigger point for exacerbation of knee OA. So when you have a secondary problem in the foot, it may have a role. And uh, actually, it was not a bad uh, thing. It, it's, a, it's got a, the recommendation was moderate, much better than a lot of other interventions that we do. So patients who have secondary problems, again, a narrow spectrum, uh, you may consider using that. Right, okay. So okay. we have done all this, and eight months later, patient comes back, and here she has got relief of pain only when she's taking NSAIDs, describes anterior and middle joint pain, increasing pain on walking, and some desk pain. She's got full range of movement. Weight action has not been successful. So here's the same patient again, and uh, Parag, yeah. what do you want to do? So, you know, we've done all this, we've done the rehab, we've yes. done the, the rehab, everything you've done, yeah. NSAIDs. So my next thing will be, I would think of some kind of an intraarticular injection uh, because it's just eight months and, you know, uh, I will ask her how much is the pain disabling her. If it's not too much, then I would think of an intraarticular option. I will give her the option of a, a hyaluronic acid and also I will suggest a, a steroid uh, injection to her and uh, I will tell her the pros and cons of both. But I will talk we, her into we'll taking a steroid. That, I think. But I will all agree on that. Yes. Anybody against injections in the knee? Uh, not against it, but we don't have an MRI yet. Won't anybody? Yes, yeah. Yeah. you need to have an MRI scanogram. So yeah. never, never steroids. Never steroids. 
I agree for uh, hyaluronic acid. I agree for PRP, uh, stromer vascular fraction if the patient opts for and agrees for, but never uh -huh. stop. Never, never steroid, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else yeah. has got strong views? Uh, I, I never use steroid as well, um, completely with that. Uh, really? Okay. Oh, I had one. Why, why is that, Sharon, you don't use steroids? No, it's, it, there's a fair amount of evidence that steroid just uh, increases the degradation of cartilage over a period of time. It'll come back with a vengeance, and I, I don't think it's a long-term benefit as well. Uh, it, it, could, it could benefit hugely if there's tendinitis all around and stuff like that. If we can focus on that and do physio, I'd be more happy than uh, putting steroid into the joint. Okay. Well, we right. Agree with Sharon. Okay. Agree with Sharon. So, Agree with Sharon. We will, we will use, uh, Stem cell therapy for this? Uh, well, that, uh, not stem no. cell therapy exactly to, to be uh, specific, but the stromal vascular fraction has worked well with me. But uh, yeah. all this stromal vascular fraction or PRP have the same effect of anti inflammatory, they just reduce the inflammation. They don't have any uh, effect on cartilage. So no, simple no. steroid can work. Yeah. No, simple no, steroid yeah. can work. Just hang, on just hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Yeah. So the literature, Sharon, that you tell about uh, uh, that the steroids is bad for joints, you got to yeah. interpret with a bit of caution, yeah. Because many of them are sponsored studies. And whenever you see this region X, you always have to be worried, you know, that they are promoting something <laughs> else. Uh, because Multi it's a billion dollar company, they have a big budget to promote a lot of things, yeah. And they say the local anesthetic is bad as well. Okay, local anesthetic is bad and steroids. And some of the senior surgeons here, would have given 10,000 injections steroids at all, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to buy that. No. But can I ask uh, a question? So, that... the, so we are, if uh, they said Marcaine is bad, so we moved on to Ropivicane. Why bother? You know, why argue that? So, Ropivicane is, uh, is supposed to be fine at least. Are no studies to say it's bad. And steroids is bad when given in the end stage disease. Right. Uh, that's the that's that cause osteonecrosis. That's been documented. There's no proven detrimental effect given in early OA. Yeah, so Sharon, we all have. I've been uh, for three years, four years with just one a very cheap steroid injection. Yeah. So let, let's not discount that. So we'll move on to hyaluronic acid. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, uh, one point, Vijay. Yeah. You know, so I also use uh, steroids, unlike uh, Sharon or Ashish. I, I use them quite often actually, and they give a dramatic relief. Especially if the patient wants immediate relief, that he has to go for some wedding yeah. or some tour. The only thing is, when you use the uh, anesthetic uh, agent with that, ropivacaine or whatever, don't use the one with the preservative. You get one without the preservative. And that is the one because the preservative actually can cause a little bit of cartilage damage. Yeah, yeah point well That's taken. Yeah. Word of caution. Sachin, uh, what is your uh, thoughts on hyaluronic acid? Oh, I. I'm quite fond of hyaluronic acid, not fond of steroids at all, except like what Parag just mentioned, you know, to tide over a very serious situation, like a wedding is a very important thing or somebody wants to travel. But otherwise, I think I use steroid once in two years or so. And one reason why I use it even less is because I saw my predecessors using it right, left, and center. Uh -huh. Yeah, Sachin, 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 any Sachin comments on HA? So it, for this particular patient, yeah, uh, no. in general. Yeah. Okay, so in general, I think HA would be a good option and uh, uh, definitely would prefer HA over cortisone unless we're dealing with an acute flare-up. <laughs> and about 70% of patients with the kind of X-ray and the uh, clinical scenario that you are describing would be happy for about anywhere between 12 to 18 months if they don't have a large coronal plane deformity. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, so yeah, so a lot of things. So there is some weak evidence that it does work, but all these are if you look really closely, they are sponsored studies. You can interpret them with a with a uh, with a pinch of salt. But again, very useful in your practice, uh, uh, and uh, and I use it a lot, and I think most of us would agree that we do in your practice. Yeah. Anyone so, for MRI before injection? Uh, for what? Yeah. Yeah. Not any degenerative meniscal tear is the cause for that pain or only Correct. arthritic we are thinking so, about. We don't have Agreed. mechanical symptoms, yeah. So we described a patient who doesn't have any mechanical symptoms, no acute exacerbation of pain, chronic problem. Uh, that's the patient profile, yeah. So we do understand and that's a little different scenario. So I mean, you may find I mean, findings. In this case, if you do an MRI, 
I'm sure many uh -huh. skeletal cancers, etc. But without clinical symptoms, uh, you don't want to act on that. Okay, we'll move on. We have a lot to cover. So we'll move on yeah. to PRP. Yes, Raju. I don't use PRP for OA as yet. I use them for sports medicine indication, and in this particular instance, I would not be inclined to use them. I would probably be more inclined to use visco supplement. Okay, Sharon. Yeah, no experience at all. I, I never use that. Yeah. So who uses it a lot for OA? I use a little bit. Uh, Jacob, I yeah, Jacob. I use LP PRP and I use interleukin one receptor antagonist when I want to buy time. <laughs> This patient, maybe I want to try and buy time. So I don't, I don't use this for supplementation because I think it doesn't work. So I will use LP, PRP, or one of these interleukin one plus Right, okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the problem with PRP is no standardization. Uh, in India, it's actually cheaper than many of the visco supplementation brands like Synvisc One, yeah. So I don't know how many of you are aware of that, yeah. So about half the price only. So. Um, yeah, these are the more and more uh, articles, maybe sponsored articles saying they do have a role in OA. So Vijay, if I can just uh, pitch in for a moment here. So uh, today, I think we are very fortunate to have Mohit Bhandari among us key group. And Mohit Bhandari runs this very nice unbiased platform called My Ortho Evidence. And if you check uh, on his platform, his consensus is that HA is equal to PRP is equal to steroid is what you've put up. So yeah, I you think, hit the nail on the head, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, think in 2020 uh, we can say yeah. steroid also used in early OA, not in late OA with risk of arsenic ah. causes. Uh, HA all uh, injections seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect, but there are some problems with steroids. It cannot be repeated, so you cannot use it in the long or medium term. That's one of the uh, drawbacks. And if used in advanced disease, we have seen cases of uh, and that must be strictly avoided. We have bone-on-bone -bone osteoarthritis. But we still have cartilage and more of an inflammatory component. And HA and PRP in acute flare-up, as uh, Parag mentioned, uh, will not be a great uh, advice to use it when you have an acute flare-up. may flare things up more. But a more chronic management seems to be useful. Yeah. So that's all. Shall we all, all agree? Anybody? Yeah. So, so Sachin, <laughs> Sachin, I have a question to you. So I actually feel that you know the conclusions what Mohit Bhandari showed and showed in this slide. Sometimes, you know, equa equating HA to a PRP to a steroid may not be the right thing to do. But have you seen this evidence? Have you read, read that article in detail? you have any more inputs on this, Sachin? So I definitely read uh, a lot of his work on my ortho evidence when I was sort of researching for one of my talks. We can definitely conclude that all the current evidence that we have, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, do suggest that HA is equal to PRP. Steroid is equal to HA is uh, very much doubtful yet. Some studies do show that HA and steroid may, be, may give the same kind of clinical outcome with respect to subjective relief of symptoms, but have not been shown to alter the course of the disease as what HA will do. So HA equals PRP, that is what sort of uh, is there for sure. Steroid and HA, clinically, the amount of relief that you get is equivalent, but the influence on the disease progression is not matched. So what is the uh, consensus? What should we advise our viewers who are on the uh, uh, webinar right now? What should be their intraarticular injection of choice? Are there, is there any algorithm, Sachin or Alankar? Acute flare-up with effusion, uh, HA will not work. You have to use a steroid. Okay. And when do you use a HA? Immunocompromised patient, and there is no local sign of infection, then a steroid is probably the way to go. Or all other sort of chronic issues, depending upon which way you want, you could either be using an HA or a PRP, depending upon your preference of use. Can I ask something to uh, the panel, our friends here? Uh, if you have an effusion and you take out an effusion, would you inject immediately? Because you need to HA? speak closer to your mic. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, no, yes. no, yes, yeah. Better. Yeah. So uh, if you have an effusion and you are aspirating an effusion which is moderate, at that time, the same sitting, you would like to inject one of these or you would wait for a week or two or then inject the second I think injection? You, I think you would inject a steroid, actually. And if, yeah, effusion but, is a mark of, uh, uh, you know, inflammation. Inflammation. Uh, and there's an inflamed joint there. And you need to have a, put a steroid inside, yeah. The most or powerful anti-inflammatory known to man is steroid, yeah. 
Vijay, for oh, HA Vijay, and... some people combine HA with steroid. What's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask that actually. Yeah, that's because they're worried about the exacerbation with uh, of HA. So they want to sort of nullify that effect. But is it a good idea to combine or does it have any side effects? HA can cause foreign body reaction, giant cell reaction. I've had biopsies. See, if at all you use HA, you want to use low molecular weight. Because it's, it's more biologic and it probably doesn't help in tribology. So I would use, if at all I use, I use low molecular weight because I've had certain that had severe reactions and had biopsy showing giant cell reactions. So I think I'm yeah. off HA. So we have differing opinions here. Sachin, yeah. So there are, there are two products, I think, which we should be aware of. Uh, there is one which is called as Singal, uh, no conflict of interest. But Singal is showing better results than the GF20 or the standard HA injection that we have. Singal is a combination of HA and steroid in the same prefilled syringe. Again, now there is more and more research that is showing that if you combine HA with PRP, and they have now special concoctions in which HA and PRP are combined, they are showing better results than PRP. Yeah, I, I came across those papers as so, well, but difficult to prove, you know, they're combining so, now uh, different things, each so, one doesn't by itself. So it's like, different things. So we're going into even more murky territory. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that. I think it makes mathematical just, sense. Eh? You said steroid is equal to HA is equal to PRP. So steroid plus HA has to be greater than PRP. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a quick thing, Vijay, before we move from this. Will the will it change? The injection will change if it is an inflammatory arthritis as against osteoarthritis, like a rheumatoid absolutely, arthritis? Absolutely. Yeah. Rheumatoid yeah, is yeah. only cortisol. I think, I think only steroid will work in inflammatory arthritis, I think. Absolutely. Correct. Okay. 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 Let's okay, move. So now we go to the uh, So the people, uh, I mean, a lot of advocates here in India as well, uh, who believe that it's the future of uh, of uh, knee surgery itself. So regenerative. So they want to regenerate the cartilage. Now I want to make it very clear what we're talking about here is the use in the elderly patient with OA and not with young patients post traumatic focal. That we'll deal with another day. But today we're talking about elderly and who would use, uh, um, you know, some kind of stem cell therapy in this. Parag? So, so I have a bias and I am against stem cell therapy at this point of time. I used it, uh, uh, sometimes I use the BMAC thing, but it, in osteoarthritis, it really doesn't work. And, you know, I have been very unhappy with the outcome of it so at this point of time i've stopped using it completely i'm just waiting some more evidence to come in to hopefully it should get refined and you know probably i'll use it a little later but at this time it's a no for me it, it's interesting when you read about uh, about use the usage of stem cells in uh, oa it again works by an anti-inflammatory effect yeah so the equation expands Steroid equals HA equals PRP equals uh, <laughs> stem cells. So we are not regenerating anything here for sure. Everybody agree agree on that? Yes. No, nobody to contradict that. Yeah. So that's a very good message. I think we need to put across to our youngsters who seem to be carried away with you know what the yeah. company guys tell us. Yeah. The supporters of stem cell actually advocate that they say that it regenerates and it actually grows cartilage and reverses. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So we come to that. Yeah. So uh, they say it regenerates cartilage. And of course, very weak evidence, all sponsored studies. And uh, it's exp the problem is it's very expensive. Literature only focuses on focal post-traumatic lesions. And the maximum it can do is an anti-inflammatory effect. It's got no regenerative potential in OA. I think we all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. But what we shouldn't, the youngsters shouldn't fall for is, look at this ad, rest in peace, knee replacement. Who knew amputating the joint and inserting metal parts wouldn't help? And the knee replacement is supposed to have died in 2020, <laughs> along with COVID. <laughs> you know, such misleading thing is what is what is really misleading is it is not a thing for knee replacement. I can even you know buy the argument if they want to use it in some PRP, early arthritis. I mean, that's okay. But to say it's an alternative for knee replacement, we're talking about end stage disease. They're talking about end stage disease, and that's really, really a wrong thing to do. That's misleading. <laughs> Everyone. That that and, tombstone uh, could be of all the orthoplasty surgeons as well. No, oh, but this is playing the fear psychosis of the patients, basically. And it's very important to have a positive environment for the cells to work. In the absence of a good biomechanical environment, all the cell therapy, PRP, will fail. 
Absolutely, yeah. But you know, when you say it's an alternative to surgery, patients jump on it. And that is, you know, feeding on, and somebody said, you know, on the fear psychosis. It's really, really a wrong thing. And I think all of us must, uh, as, a, as a body, must make a strong statement to condemn this. And it says, don't replace, regrow. I mean, it is, it is never can be an alternative for a replacement, yeah. It's like Not using... Enough. It's like using Dr. Ortho oil by Javed Akhtar, where people say that it will recreate the oil in the joint. <laughs> one of you, one of you will replace his knee. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So, a very clear message, I think, from the SKI that it is not rigid any cartilage can never ever be uh, the next 20 years can never ever be an alternative to knee replacement. Yeah. Whether it has some role in early OA, controversial. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. And then, uh, if at all, the last five years, uh, the enthusiasm on stem cell therapy for OA has come down rather than going up. And a lot of promise in 2014, 2013. The next five years has been a downhill trend. A lot of papers saying it's got no regenerative potential at all. If at all, it's going, it's going downhill rather than uphill. Although a lot of centers in India market it and use it. Yeah. As an alternative to knee replacement. They want patients uh, listed for knee replacement to come to them, you know, that's really, really a wrong thing. That's cheating and that must be avoided. I think we all agree on that. Absolutely. Right. Okay. It's a different patient now. So she's uh, 55 years old. She again is a little overweight, significant knee pain, not cope with ADL, significant sleep disturbance, did not respond to a proper. So when patient says I had IFT for 10 days, that's not physiotherapy. It's a proper rehab, probably supervised by yourself, and all not responded and she comes with this now. So is this a, a single joint weight bearing x-ray or is it a supine x-ray? One leg is a weight bearing x-ray. Okay. All the x-rays that I show, we never take non-weight bearing x-rays single leg in our unit. Yeah, so all yeah, that was one of the questions which came to me. That's why I asked. Was the, one of the viewers wanted to ask, is it important to take a single joint weight bearing? So that's the answer. So Absolutely. You, absolutely. Yeah. You have to take that. Yeah. You should. And you're, you're, you need to work with your radiographer and get good x-rays. We get a good lateral view, very important. We get a good AP view. And unless you work with a radiographer, you never get good x rays. Okay? Absolutely. So, uh, who wants to, Vikas? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hear you, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, thank you. This is a patient so, profile. Yeah, I know. 55 year old, 81 kgs is a high BMI patient. And. Uh, looks like a complete medial joint line disease. So I would straight away get an MRI done immediately to see the position of the ligaments. And, to see the position uh, of the? Would, to the ligaments, the ACL why? and... Uh, why? Because why? I'm, I'm looking at an intervention at this point. Yeah, but uh, lateral X-ray says clearly that it's an intact ACL. ACL. Uh, He'll go for a vulgar stress X-ray. Yes, yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, but that is more a, of a, a clinical... So we got X-ray. So, so yeah. you, who will go for an MRI apart from Vikas? No. 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 Bhushan also will go for MRI. Yeah, I'll why? go for MRI. Yeah, yeah, Bhushan, why would you do an MRI? Bhushan, your reasoning. So, uh, so uh, uh, I just uh, we're planning for surgical intervention now. Yes. Uh, she has she has failed conservative management. Yes. Now, either it, it so the my uh, it's a grade four arthritis. So my two options are either a unicompartmental or a total knee replacement. Absolutely. So, yes. And Absolutely. for that, I think it's always better to get an MRI because quite a few times you're surprised on table. You see a big lateral uh, defect on the femoral condyle. You can find yes. a bucket and tail lateral yeah. meniscus or a radial tail lateral meniscus, which will change your management option. You can always have both the things on table and decide yeah, on yeah, table, yeah, but yeah, better you go with one plan in mind. Can I intervene? Yeah. A buccal tear of the lateral meniscus will be symptomatic. Yeah. Yes. Many times we'll find asymptomatic tears, degenerative tears, because degenerative disease, and they are not to be taken into. The problem with the MRI in this situation is that it confuse what you're going to do. And I think uh, the general opinion is MRI is indicated only when there is an acute or chronic symptoms in this patient. That's when an MRI would be indicated. And there's a chronic pain, chronic disease. MRI would probably confuse the picture. Yeah. Would you Clinically, agree? One, lateral one joint thing. line tenderness. One, yeah, yeah. yeah, just one okay. more thing. Is the I also have to see the lateral part of the patellofemoral joint. If that is affected, then I am uh, more keen to go towards a, a total than a partial knee replacement. Yeah, that is extremely rare in this uh, situation, I must yeah. say. Uh, that's a primary patellofemoral OA that comes yeah. in, which is extremely rare in this type but, of scenario. But anyway. I know how to do uh, yeah. skyline view. 
but uh, i was okay, so we don't want to do an mr now so let us uh, summarize summarize saying uh, uh, in this presentation uh, chronic presentation mri is useless and what you probably most relevant is a stress x ray and a scanogram anybody uh, wants to say yes no uh, so I, I is vijay yeah. if the patient is not willing for a replacement uh, would you all give uh, uh, offer uh, hto but we are not decided no. what to do for a patient yet okay okay you think probably yeah. time for surgery now as everybody agreed yeah. uh, absolutely what is but what surgery we haven't uh, decided yet vijay so we, so for me it's a clearly and uh, for me it's a clearly an amo uh, with quickly yeah yeah for me it's a clearly an amo with acl intact and uh, i won't fight if somebody wants to do an mri scan but it's bone on bone amo and 55 uh, for me it i'm tending more towards a uni uni yeah so uh, before before that there are some things to uh, uh, you know to to evaluate the patient yeah so the more relevant investigations would be a stress x ray and uh, and a scanogram rather than an mri and uh, when you have an acute or chronic patient has been sort of going on for a few years suddenly she comes and says excruciating pain i cannot walk and then or mechanical symptoms then of course no question that you need an mri yeah. so we we'll all agree on this agreed and we also need to know the amount of flexion deformity fft uh, no 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 flexion deformity yeah okay Full range of movements for inflammatory yeah. arthritis. So, so the X-rays are very important. Unless you do a valgus stress X-ray or a scanogram, I don't think you can do an MRI. But I also, you know, might do an MRI in certain cases. It's not a complete no. But yeah, yeah. Do an MRI yeah. without doing the special X-rays. So when, when that's not good. Add up, when there is something doesn't add up, when you have lateral side pain, uh, then of course an MRI. When you are not sure, but when the picture is like this, uh, medial pain and some anterior pain, uh, I think. Uh, mri is the problem with mri is it's not that it's not it will take you on the wrong track right okay here is the uh, half uh, of the patients come the, to the mri yeah. yes the chronic presentation that we had and these are the uh, uh, the varus stress and the valgus stress and that's just scano it does not show much of mal alignment yeah i have not drawn the lines right yeah yeah but it's, it's seen quite clear so in case you want to take that on this is an ideal indication to do ukr sir i'll go for you ssvp this is a primary no, okay. it's not ra so what did the uh, stress x rays tell you it's a correctable varus and there is no lateral joint line reduction yeah so uh, what about people who don't do ukrs they all keeping quiet so here is a, a good case for me to consider an osteotomy high tibial osteotomy correct i, I agree uh, keep that in mind and uh, i would uh, think of a hto So my, so my reason you, for uh, yeah UKR would be sorry uh, carry on yeah so uh, this, this is not a case for a total knee definitely uh, a UKA or a STO yes Ashish go on so I agree with you uh, 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 for me uni is not an option here patient is a high BMR BMI and uh, she's fifty five uh, I would consider doing an arthroscopy see if there is any meniscus tear and see the lateral joint line. The lateral joint line is the lateral side is normal. No, no, I told you the symptoms. Yeah, there's no lateral symptoms. Only medial joint pain she has. No, see, uh, sim symptoms are different. Uh, you see arthroscopically if the lateral side, lateral joint is arthritic, if the cartilage is is worn out, it is not an option. And you straight away go go for TKR. Um, that's what I do. And if uh, the lateral side is normal, arthroscopically, then I would uh, proceed to HTO. In But again, BMI is the issue with STO. No, yeah, exactly. uh, why would that be? Lady, yeah, in yeah. Fact, lady, more than thirty BMI is a contraindication. So for lady, me, uh, BMI is for UK. Gentlemen, gentlemen, yeah. Let me let me summarize. Yeah. So generally, we'll come to that. But generally, you know, short obese patients uh, are not good candidates for HTO. Here is a deformity. Usually, the lines uh, cross the joint. Yeah, they usually the ones that are uh, they have more of extra ocular component. This you would call as an intraocular virus. Uh, that you know is a spectrum we understand, but think the problem with the the lateral X-ray, I mean the valgus stress, tells you how the lateral compartment is. Probably is the most uh, important indicator of how the cartilage is rather than the MRI. So we have done that. I think most people would agree on that. So yes. yeah. So we yeah. will. So, so 
So Vijay. So, so Vijay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of questions before we go to the, what you did. If yeah. you can just go to the previous side, there are some questions which I have got. So yes. the first question is: Is there really role of arthroscopic debridement in this situation? So yeah, the good thing that's been brought up. There's strictly yes. no role for an arthroscopic washout. Yeah. So when they have mechanical symptoms, they exactly. have acute and chronic presentation where they have a root tear, etc. Then uh, a role for arthroscopy, but arthroscopic washout. That study after study after study has shown has got no role to play. The message is very so, clear. So, Prag, I I I never do arthroscopic washout. That's out. Yes. Uh, the only indication for arthroscopy is if I'm doing an STO, and I want to confirm that the lateral joint line is normal, okay. and uh, the cartilage is good, and then I proceed to STO. Uh, for uh, patients less than 65, uni is not an option for me. Okay. Because that's what the literature says. Uh, another question which has come up okay. uh, on uh, from the viewers is: What are the role of uh, the blood investigations? What kind of blood workup should be done for these patients of arthritic knees? So, uh, anybody wants to take that? What kind of? Well, in the interest okay. of time, we'll move on. For yeah. uh, the, the we have signs of inflammatory arthritis. They have, you know, yeah. foot, for okay. example, early morning stiffness. The X-ray picture is not classical of OA. You'd investigate them. Okay. Otherwise, you just have to call it as a you know classical OA and move on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's move. Uh, on. Vijay, sir, do you mind if I just Vijay, put in a word? Quickly, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. please. Yeah. Yeah, in this kind of a situation, Dr. Ashish sir was mentioning that uh, he wouldn't do it in a patient age less than 65, the uni. Uh, but what we have done at the Sunshine is that we have kind of had a bimodal. Um, indication. So even like a little younger age, we do a uni to get a little bit of a time, maybe 15, 20 years. And in the older age, because that um, definitely that's a less morbid uh, procedure, if they have this kind of an x-ray, we would like to do it. So yeah. even the Oxford team also had mentioned that they do it the similar way. Yeah, well, point well taken. Adarsh, is a, the uni has got a bimodal peak, as we all know. But the thing you should not do is if you are not a, a experienced in the uni, a young patient comes to you, uh, once in a year, you must not go in and do a uni on that patient. Yeah, definitely, sir. Yes, I... this unit, it's got a bimodal peak all over the world, and I think that's a fair comment from others. Yeah. Okay. So we will move on with that. So I think it has got a. Vijay, can I quickly? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. You know, I'm, my own. Yeah, yeah. My only point I was trying to say is, if it is bone on bone, uh, for me, a HTO is a dicey. Thing to do if it is joint pace decreased, then I would look at HTO. Uh, Sachin has got strong views on this, that's why I wanted to put it up. What does he think about it? Yes, Sachin. Yeah, Sachin. Sachin, you're not audible. The best results, hello. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. the best results for uh, uni are only when you have bone on bone disease. If you don't have bone on bone disease, Correct. then your yeah. results no, no, are. No, 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 no. That's no, one. No, and if you don't have bone on bone disease and HTO is a better procedure, the results of a HTO in the presence of bone on bone disease are slightly are inferior yeah. to those spectrum, yeah. Of yeah. when you don't have bone on bone disease. So, that both sides. Yeah. yeah, we agree on that. The, the, the that, problem that, is the overnight, the patient doesn't the point, become yeah. bone on bone. Yeah. So, it's a spectrum there. And we'll, I'll, I will summarize it just in a while, yeah. Okay, so this is a, this is a sort of a classical profile for a uni. That's what we did. And uh, the radiology is very fascinating. That's the reason why you don't need an MRI. Here's a patient of mine from the US. He came to me for a uni. You can see the right side is a more advanced disease. And that's how the lateral side looks. This was the benefit of juniors. And see how the posterior third of the, in a good lateral X-ray is eroded. Telling you that you do not have AMOA, you have tri-compartment OA, so classical, you can see that, yeah. Same patient, same X-ray, weight-bearing X-ray. Here he has got an AMOA, and that's how the lateral X-ray looks like. And you can see, so both X-rays look a little similar. This is AMOA, how do I know it's AMOA? I'm looking at the lateral view. And you can see that the posterior third is intact, and the mid-third has been sclerosis here, classical. How do I know this is tri-compartment uh, uh, OA? Because the posterior third is involved, classical X-rays. The, the pedal joint looks almost the same. So the best index of looking at whether it's the AMOA or a tricompartmental is your X-ray. Good, well done X-rays. So this is a nice illustration of that. Yeah. So whereas you have the little different presentation when you have an acute or chronic presentation, there's no malalignment, and then you may uh, do an MRI, you have a root repair, or you have an unstable meniscus, degenerative, you may deal with it. 
or if we find bone marrow edema, uh, then the subchondroplasty, you put calcium, this was very popular a few years ago, but now again, uh, it has fallen in disrepute, it's not very useful, but uh, uh, it was popular three, four years ago. So acute and chronic presentation, an MRI is very uh, important to look at all these things where you can avoid a major surgery, but it's very important to rule out, to keep in mind the alignment is normal. Then you can do these things. We go to the next patient. He's um, 51 years old. Uh, he's got left knee pain for uh, 18 months, seen by many orthopedic surgeons, various conservative options have been tried. And he has full range of movement. He's 68, he's got no coma or disc. Very active patient, yeah. Alankar, you want to take it? It's to you. Anybody else uh, would like to go for scanogram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In all these patients whom it's, we are talking about AMOA or early arthritis are just beyond AMOA, the spectrum, I think a scanogram is vital. And if you're not doing scanograms in your practice, you really must not be uh, dealing with knee arthritis. You're really not doing uh, justice in 2020. A scanogram is absolutely vital. Yeah. Can I put for a point, sir? Jacob, you want to take this any? What would you do, Jacob? Have only issues that if you are doing an STO, will you correct it to the fifty-seven point, or are you going to make it neutral? Uh, uh, so what's the degree of Anybody that's not a uh, yeah. yes, sir. Uh, sir, one interesting point in this X-ray is the metaphyseal virus. If you see a if you see a virus knee with the metaphyseal virus, these are the patients who respond very well to STO rather than uh, the intraarticular virus, which we saw in your second case. Yes. Having said that, um, uh, it depends, sir, if the uh, the amount of correction you aim just lateral to the lateral uh, tibial spine, uh, the junction of the lateral tibial spine with the medial uh, with the with the plateau there. Uh, normally, we don't uh, do excessive corrections uh, for early disease, but if the involvement is quite significant, probably we'll aim uh, in shifting mm -hmm. the uh, axis to the pitches of a point. Yeah, um, yeah, Jacob, to answer your question, which is the point is sort of uh, people are going off it and doing much less correction. They just want to push it into valgus. They don't want to go 30 to 40, uh, you know, percentile as uh, described by Fujisawa. So that is a thing. And this is this patient has got uh, HQ written all over him. So he's an active guy. He's got only uh, discomfort, you know, no focal pain, active related discomfort and all that. So I think a scanogram is a must. And that is the uh, pre-op, and this is the post-op scanogram. We cut it into valgus. Yeah. Typically, a patient who do a HTO, this line must be uh, falling outside your knee. That's a that's another way of looking for metaphyseal virus. And it doesn't do much of joint line you know, metaphyseal virus. These are classical. They do extremely well with the HTO. And I think all knee surgeons must have a repertoire, uh, uh, either a colleague or yourself doing a HTO. Otherwise. You are just not, uh, you know, uh, standard of care in 2020. Exactly. So, so Jacob, to answer your question, you know, if you're doing an HTO, I would never get it to neutral. I would definitely overcorrect it. I would go to the Fujisawa point. But at times, a little more than that also. So, uh, unless you should should I ask, ask this too, Dr. Parag? No, I yeah. think Vijay said he wouldn't do the Fujisawa point. I thought I would do that. Sachin, Sachin will hear your view. Yes, Sachin. Uh, you unmute it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think one aspect here is that if you see the post-op X-ray, the joint line appears to be tilted. Bhushan will be uh, discussing this aspect uh, with me on this, that the joint line should not get tilted. So yeah. what we see here is that we actually need to measure the MPTA and the LDFA. And I actually feel that the MPTA here is more than 90 degrees. So if the MPTA is more than 90 degrees, then this patient may not have the world's so best result um, with his HTO. If you go yeah, back to the previous okay, slide, slide, if you go back to the previous slide in which we saw uh, extra articular type of deformity, which was there, such patients, I think uh, many a times, I would prefer to treat them with what is called as a TCVO or a transcondylar val valgus osteotomy in which you only elevate the medial tibial condyle and not take the hinge point right down to the lateral end. So Bhushan, your inputs on this particular yeah, so and technique. 
if you look at the scanogram uh, preoperatively, you can see some subluxation also. So if that's the case, then usually you need a bigger correction. And the moment you do a correction more than 12, 13 millimeters, you need to start worrying about your joint line convergence angle. Uh, if your joint line becomes oblique, irrespective of wherever, wherever, wherever you got your Mikulis point, that is going to fail in seven to eight years. A, a properly done, the properly done HTO without a tilting joint line should give 15, 20 years relief in my opinion. Correct. Now, uh, a TCVO is a good option when there is subluxation. And when you do a preoperative planning, if your expected MPTA goes to beyond 93, then I think uh, either you're doing a, uh, doing something wrong, you might need a double level correction or a TCVO. Correct. I think this is uh, fairly recent for uh, most of the younger audience, but uh, this is something to uh, see. So the question, in this scanogram. question comes Bhushan and Sachin, how do you control that? So what are the steps, what are the tips you would do? So the first thing is always planning this. So you line. always plan your osteotomy with uh, whatever technique you want to do. You can uh, put a, use a tracing paper and, and a goniometer. Uh, you can use a computer software like uh, we do, but you need to plan the surgery and actually measure the angles after the surgery to see what you're achieving. If your medial prox uh, mechanical proximal tibial medial angle is going beyond 93, the 90 is a higher limit, then I think that's my cutoff point. Uh, I don't know what Sachin wants to add to this. Yeah, I would agree with you. So anyways, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, pro proceed, yeah. Points on uh, HTO, yeah. So uh, these days, I think, uh, you know, for the younger audience, uh, the gold standard is, uh, the, uh, the problem with HTO was it was not standardized uh, a few years ago. Now I think it's, everyone will agree, it's pretty standard. You have to do a medial open weight biplanar HTO with preservation of the lateral hinge, stabilized with a load bearing locking plate. With all these adjectives, I think that's the gold standard today. And the, the issue is that it was very, um, um, you know, the results were not reproducible, but now with this technique, with very reproducible technique, consistent results, and you get early function. Yeah. So all the negatives of earlier years have gone now, and uh, all centers seem to get good. A lot of published reports saying excellent outcomes in the medium and the long term. Would anybody want to add anything or contradict anything? May I ask one to Dr. Parak? Yes. You told you will go be Fujisawa beyond Fujisawa. So do you counsel your patient about limb length discrepancy with such a valgus? No. So when I say Fujisawa, my point I was trying to make is that I will definitely overcorrect it. You know, mm. if you see the... Uh, that will lead to some lengthening? Not really. You know, one millimeter beyond Fujisawa point will not actually cause that lengthening. So, you know... If you see Koshino's work, you know, Koshino has done a lot of work. He used to be a strong proponent of uh, close wedge. And he always said that, you know, you should uh, uh, correct to 185, 186, 187. So that's what he taught. And that has helped. And when I moved from close wedge to open wedge, I always saw that I slightly got that over correction. And it helps in good pain relief also. And, uh, you know, sometimes you lose correction. So even if you lose a couple of millimeters, you still are okay. So that's one more reason why I, I overcorrect. Uh, Parag, your point well taken, but world over now the they find the Fujisawa point is too much of correction now. You know, right. right. So they're coming also little. Depends on the severity of arthritis in the medial compartment. If it's grade four, then I think we should go to sixty percent plus in terms of your correction. If it's grade three or grade two, you you are it's entirely acceptable to go between fifty five to sixty percent. But it's grade four arthritis on the medial side that you need to push it more laterally. Right. I think that's what I feel at least. Unless you're a sports person, you may not like it. Am I right? Uh, I don't think uh, you would. You'll be uh, you'll be doing HTO for any sports person. It's usually a career-ending thing. If you do a HTO for anyone, they they can't run properly afterwards. So I warn the patient that your running career is going to be over. I think the only game you can play is table tennis after that or golf. That's what I tell them. One quick question which has come two, three times on my WhatsApp now. So the question is that, you know, is there any role of proximal fibular osteotomy? You know, this is now... <laughs> Sachin is expert in that now. <laughs> I didn't know Sachin does that. So, three Parag will... question has come. So, so very quickly... I'll cover it, Parag. I'll cover it. We've got slides for that. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. Let's go on. So, in 2020, both have become extremely reliable with gratifying surgeries. Yeah, both... Uh, 
provided is technically done correctly many technical issues to both and you must be a, have a volume you must uh, have uh, you have a volume and you become very good over time and it gives really uh, both of them give extremely pleasing results in 2020 i think we all uh, would agree on that yeah yeah the question is always what juniors ask is how to choose you know it's a tough choice they feel it's tough like choosing between android and iphone but actually it's not actually yeah it's a very theoretical question to ask in my opinion yeah so if you see that a spectrum here you can see that for hgo is partial thickness cartilage loss as a lot of panelists brought out is not really gross bone on bone oa the younger patient higher activity level significant extra gear component as clement said typically they have activity related discomfort of doing some particular activity they get discomfort uh, the short lateral fat patient is a relative contraindication whereas here we have bone on bone changes older patient usually female patient obese patient uh, bone on bone erosion you see lesser activity level probably night pain uh, little or no mall alignment focal pain the short lateral pain is not a contraindication they are actually good candidates for this procedure now putting both together ap instability is a problem in both but it's more readily addressed in a hgo lack of full flexion is a problem in both but again more accommodated in a hgo rather than a uni and only mild ml laxity is acceptable in both so in summary of this uh, topic is that anybody wants to add anything yeah so the night pain sometimes uh, we uh, face in root tear uh, probably that would be a yeah uh, point taken yeah Uh, sometimes yeah yeah we acute, agree on acute on chronic situation we have to suspect the root tear so which... so if you put you know the patient the extreme it's very easy to know who is a candidate for which procedure and obviously there will be a gray area in the middle but that's a, not a very big area and so it's not in most 90% of patient not difficult to make out it's a better option of the two and i think you must have both in the armatorium i say i don't do unis i don't do hgos i don't think today kind of care you must have or a colleague of yours is able to uh, address this i think we all agree on that Yeah. So one point I would like to make is that Vijay, if along with this, it's a different scenario that if a patient has a ligament insufficiency at times which he may have, then the HTO has an advantage because you can do a slope modification also. And that's what that's what I said. AP instability. Yes. But both we can do a slope modification and and deal with AP instability, whereas you can't do that in a in a uni. Correct. Unless you're going to do a ACL reconstruction, yes. we'll not go into that. Yeah. So okay. what, what about if you have spunk? Funk. Yeah. Will you do straight for a uni or will you go for a STO? Funk. Mm -hmm. If well established funk, I'll do a TK. Exactly. I was just going to say that because you never know. You will do a uni. Achin will do a uni, I think. Uh, I will do uni. You know, funk uh, needs a TK. It's as simple as that. Really. But why is that? You're what uni compartment disease. You're jumping. It can progress. Other side. side. well uh, i mean you don't have bone to sit your uh, sit your components on that you don't know how far the disease is gone and i mean you may get away in a patient or two but if you want reliable results uh, i think uh, uh, you have to do a t care on them okay so i think here we need to sort of uh, differentiate between uh, the bone marrow edema and the spong that you get on the tibial side and that on the femoral side if you have it on the tibial side then definitely uni is out of question if you have it on the femoral side if the whole thing gets a sclerotic rim after a while then you can do a uni if you are doing surgery when you don't have a sclerotic rim and you've not developed the classic osteonecrosis per se yeah sachin you know I, I, you and me both have done i've done at least uh, you know 500 uh, research things on avian and all his bone marrow edema and all is okay but if follow them in the long term it's a different ball game okay so what's the conclusion you <laughs> I, i i won't do that i mean uh, It's not easy to keep your femoral component on a necrotic bone. Although you think it's bone marrow edema, you never know how the AVN is going to progress. So, uh, you know, I think uh, TKR is a much safer option in uh, in those patients. Yeah. So, so anyway, bone can... marrow edema, Sachin, is yeah. one of the you know beginning uh, evidence of spunk. You don't know some of the bone marrow edemas may progress to spunk. So he's differentiated yeah. tibia from the femur. Yeah, so tibia, I don't think I would like to do it on the femoral side. When we know that the history is going on for about three months, and you see a sclerotic rim, I would not be hesitant to do a UKR. I have got follow up of about five patients who are more than almost about eighteen years now with uh, having uni done, 
and uh, they are doing really well so yeah, great uh, great satin yeah. i take your point but okay. i think you know in larger series and all uh, we need to uh, i mean i know the oxford guys say it's okay yeah. but the oxford guys are very uh, what shall we say very um, very strict about everything there they just say okay so what do you take care you know but we want us our private patients and we need to be careful yeah um okay. so vijay we have about 15 minutes more no problem yeah, okay i think that be just correct yeah into 20 minutes yeah so a lot of uh, uh, you know level 1 papers saying you know the unicompound knee uh, is you know not that each one is superior both are equal and if you patient selection is important and both gives very 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 good results in 2020 and i think everyone treating the knee arthritis must uh, have some method of offering the patient uh, not that what you like but what is the patient more suitable for whether it's a uni or a hto which uh, uni is uh, uh, see hto is so versatile whereas there is very less indications for a good uni good indication i think i think you are very skeptical about uni but i think yeah. lot of uh, us here would uh, you know or uh, or once you build up experience uh, you find you cross all these uh, so all these hto is i think yeah. more versatile and uh, as compared to uni you have to very be very choosy for uni you know I, that's why i'm saying you can argue both ways you know there is a, literature says uh, there's no superiority one over the other patient selection is important that's the bottom line yeah. right okay now we come to Let's another go. patient yes. he's also in her 50s uh obese significant knee pain she has got ankle pain and shin pain and did not respond again to proper non operative management yeah okay so uh who wants to take that vikas adesh adesh you take that adesh uh yes sir so i would again definitely like to get the stress x rays first uh it does look like a bone on bone from here This is, a, uh, this is a stress X-ray. This is a stress X-ray. Yeah, and then I would like a valgus stress as well. And um, because uh, what what did you say? Fifty-seven uh, years old. So I That's still again wouldn't uh, hesitate to uh, consider a uni again, sir. Yeah. Uh, The anybody has got any other opinion? Can't you? Bone metabolism. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uni is is an option, but at this age, uh, HTO is an equally good option for me here. Yeah. the um, you know uh, somebody was saying metabolic yeah so this probably the type of just articular that, osteoporosis is there yeah and then yeah. you know uh, they have i didn't want to say back pain because it be obvious but she had back pain neck pain uh, basically pain all over and she also got knee pain and also it looks like you know uh, almost bone on bone we we focus on this and we jump on this to do the uh, knee replacement and they end up worse than what they are and this is probably you know you have to push yourself to say it's bone on bone so when it's not really classical bone on bone you got to apply your mind to it and some of them uh, you know far very worse than that so the point i want to make to the juniors is that uh, uh, so somebody wanted this other she wanted this yes sir change i think the management uh, valgus is okay yeah. but the point i really want to make is that uh, any kind of arthroplasty does not do well in uh, partial thickness cartilage loss this is no one again and the common yes, reason why tcare has got a relatively a bad name in the community is because people do knee replacement and a partial knee replacement in patients who do not have full cartilage mm-hmm. thickness loss the source of the pain is not the knee in those patients it's something else and you are offering a treatment which will not uh, benefit them in any way and this is the common reason i feel that they have uh, in our country that we have a bad reputation for knee replacement and you know the other knee looks like this and the one knee we may try compartmental so they just get get on and do a knee replacement and uh, they go and tell their neighbor who really needs a knee replacement that knee replacement doesn't work so my my message to juniors is that please do not do any kind of arthroplasty in a patient who does not have established well established bone and bone disease does anybody want to add on or contradict that Absolutely. one of the common yeah, absolutely thing correct sir yes sir is uh, patients undergoing tcr on one side and uh, they have mild to moderate arthritis on the other side and surgeons do a bilateral knee replacement it's quite a few times seen that uh, the the knee which was less bad becomes the worst knee after surgery absolutely so, we have seen that so many times so yeah, many so many many times just, yeah. especially for the youngsters and people who are quite keen on doing bilateral 
it's quite e- important to understand both the knees should be equally bad to do bilateral yeah it doesn't mean that you can do a union on them as well so you must establish very sure that you are dealing with bone on bone oa before you offer them arthroplast i think that's a so what the one point that you want to take from this whole exercise today our round table discussion is this point please do not do arthroplasty when you do not have bone on bone disease so what about tkr for mono compartment oa so that is the other issue that we are not covered yeah so here's a mono compartment oa you can see that the posterior third is intact now uh, people like uh, parag you don't do uni yeah am i right not many my numbers are not too high. i i do unis but not as much yeah so uh, uh, what are your thoughts on doing uh, tkr in this amoa yeah so uh, for a person who doesn't do any unis at all, at all or doesn't do any high tibial osteotomy then this is a case if you tried all non operative modalities is a knee replacement for me you know it also uh, at times depends on you know what is your judgment of progression because in a uni you do a uni and it progresses to a lateral compartment in couple of years then that's bad so uh, age is one thing i'll keep in mind you know uh, and also the x rays and in this particular case an mri no no for no, no, the thing that we want to know is uh, how does tkr so i don't know do uni so i do tkr on this patient how do you think it will fare uh, it will do very well it will do very well i have no doubt in my mind if i do a knee replacement there's no doubt that patient anybody has got a contradictory opinion on that uh, can i put can in a point not sir? not, yeah, not contradictory yes sir yeah sorry sir so i mean of course we only started doing unis since the last 2 years uh, before that all these cases would have been done at tkr in fact we have a paper where we studied all our tkrs and we found 45% of our patients undergoing tkr had amoa then we did another paper recently to study whether the patients undergoing tkr with amoa are they faring better or do they have a little worse satisfaction and we did find that tkr patients under i mean undergoing tkr for amoa they had a little bit less satisfaction than a uh, uni for amoa yeah i think the point that's well taken adesh that's the point i want to bring out as well that uh, this uh, dissatisfaction in uh, that we all talk about 20% but if you look at really those patients uh, who have dissatisfaction a lot of them are early disease and you see this they have Uh, i mean the spectrum of course so earlier the disease the worst they do if we do one on two uh, kelegren state they do very badly we do 3 4 uh, again so you need to have established uh, tri compartment oa for the tkr to be i mean we do have patients who have done very well as well but if you have a large cohort you'll find more and more unhappy patients if you do in amoa yeah, but if you don't know how to do a uni then it's okay it's perfectly okay to do that but uh, keep in mind and once your volume increases you get more unsatisfactory patients and that's been proven in literature again and again so you need definitely is a more natural option you know it preserves your ligaments and nowadays that is why we are talking about bi cruciate retaining total knee replacement so the whole point is if you retain the cruciates a uh, uni is a, a natural uh, uh, joint that, that that is one side of the coin but the other side of the coin is how does tkr fare itself we have your, your whole whole of tkr patients Correct. The unhappy patients, maybe you look back, maybe your early arthritis patients. Yeah, it's I mean general. more. There are some of who do extremely well, of course, but some, you know, if you have a large volume, it will start to show up that those are the unhappy patients. Which at what level will you think the patellofemoral joint is going to take play a role here? You never you ignored the patella completely here in all in, your uh, in uni in in anything in your osteotomies or uni. When do you ever look? You didn't. come in anything on the patellofemoral joint at all neither yeah. symptom neither the, experience the patellofemoral joint at least what i believe is a entirely a different disease which uh, manifests as chondromalacia etc and they have i uh, think a lot of arthroscopic procedures uh, do work in those situations but that's not knee oa so amoa and tricompartment oa are a little different disease from the primary uh, patellofemoral oa and the oa in the patellofemoral changes that occur secondary to knee oa can be ignored Every case. Yeah. Every case. Yeah. Yeah. Every case. You don't bother about lateral side, middle side, I, nothing. Can I counter? Can I add uh, some points? I don't agree. Uh, yeah, Clement. Clement. Yeah. Point, yeah. Clement. Yeah. Uh, sir, I've been focusing more on patellofemoral problems uh, in my HCU patients, uh, especially preoperatively. They have a lateral patella pain, uh, which is uh, due to an excessive lateral pressure syndrome. I often do taping, like mechanical taping, to see how much relief uh, is getting. So many times nowadays we add patellofemoral surgeries also along with the STO, uh, something like a lateral retinacular lengthening, 
people who have a pronounced lateral osteophyte in the patella they undergo a partial lateral physiotomy also and in fact some of the patients uh, elderly patients um, uh, like 65 plus who have oa but the source of pain uh, is a patellofemoral pain we've been doing isolated pet patellofemoral surgeries like lateral release debridement uh, Orthoscopy combined with open testectomies. Uh, we've been having very good early results. So I think when you're doing STO, you have to probably address your patellofemoral status. You may want to correct uh, some of the problems, especially the lateral sided pain using lateral release or lateral retinacular lengthening, or even a partial lateral testectomy if you find a lateral patella facet spur. So this has been our experience yeah, of yeah. Like this. Yeah, I agree with you fully. That's why I said the disease is a little different. Now, just because the patient has got knee OA on the x-ray doesn't mean it's symptomatic, yeah. The patient has got only patellofemoral symptoms, lateral patella pain, it's probably arthroscopic surgery is very much justified, but that's a little different disease. And they don't need to address the knee OA. How many patients in the road we see who have got gross virus, no pain, x-ray probably shows strike compartment OA, doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean a thing at all. So we're talking about symptomatic patients who have patellofemoral symptoms are a different bunch. And this is a different bunch. So both are little different diseases. And that is for our next roundtable discussion. And we're not talking about those patients now. In this okay. AMOA type, progressing to tricompartment OA, early OA, petlofemoral joint, uh, changes are secondary to this disease. And they, by and large, can be ignored. So when you find total lateral loss of cartilage, that is a primary petlofemoral disease. Medial changes, medial facial disease is secondary to OA changes. It can be... I think you have to make it out, of course. You don't want to treat a primary petlofemoral OA with a uni. That's a great mistake to do. But make it out, but it's a different disease uh, spectrum there. Would uh, people concur on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If okay. it's a lateral patellofemoral joint, you know, the lateral facet of the patella is involved, and that's not a good indication for a uni. Yeah, so that's a little different disease. Now, for whatever reason, we don't get frank uh, primary petlofemoral OA, like the Western population, which needs a Petlofemoral uh, replacement. We don't find that disease here in India that much, so we leave it for another day discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is an, another interesting patient. He came to me following a PFO. Uh, Para, can you see that? Yes. The problem with him was uh, one year after the PFO, and um, uh, and the pain uh, is really not gone away. Yeah, so the proximal fibula osteotomy, that's the long form of PFO for the benefit of the viewers. Yeah. Yes, that's a PFO is a, a, a proximal fibula. It's no more proximal, it's much more uh, distal these days. So who who does PFO here? Not me. Sachin? No way. I've only revised them. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. So what's the message? So, no, no, no. How are you going to treat this patient? Can we get some better x-rays? Uh, yeah, do you have any closer x-rays? So firstly, just quickly uh, get the question out of the way of whether a PFO is a good option or is it uh, definitely a bad option and we should avoid doing it. So I, I, we'll come to that in a second, Parag. We'll, okay. uh, can somebody say how they're going to treat this problem? So it's got an AMOA for which a PFO has been done. I'm sorry I don't have the other x-rays. I tried to search it. I couldn't find it yet. So, so what do you do for him? Anyway, we are spending a lot of time. Put a uni on it. So those are the pair of pictures. Okay. And there's the post of pictures. Okay. And guess what? The pain didn't go away. Oh. Uh, got uh, similar uh, uh, OA. Sorry? I can see the petal of petal of there. Uh, okay. well, I, I don't, don't have the X-rays, but uh, I don't think it has petal of OA. Um, and. Um, uh, Danshaga Raja from Ganga Hospital, uh, he, is, I mean, he told me that when he does a TKR on post PFOs, the bone on the lateral side is very soft for TKR. So it's not as innocuous as it looks. It's got its complications. So you can't say that, uh, you know, that um, it has got no complications. I, I think it, uni is contraindicated. Yeah. The TKR may not also be not be that easy. So. It's a note to be fair. The uni is contraindicated because the lateral compartment is soft, is it? Does it become softer? We, we still don't know. We need more evidence on this. Uh, okay. I think all of us who are operated on post-PFO patients must pull our data to find what's happening. But 
uh, even the few tickets that I did, uh, the bone looked very soft. So it's not as innocuous as it looks. So you need to be uh, need more data on that. So you cannot what say it's a, it's, it's a very it's a very yeah. Vijay, it's a very Chennai. It's a very Chennai surgery. This PFO. Not really. Uh, not really. Uh, not really. No, Bang, Bangalore. At least there not not many people in this part of the uh, Bangalore. There are not many people doing this. Arey Sharan is becoming very famous okay. everywhere. So so many people have started doing proximal tubular ostomy now. No, there is an alternative I universe. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> so Vijay's friend Prakash does a lot of that. It has been popular in this a lot. So I yeah. So uh, the I mean uh, I don't want to say it has got no. Uh, I mean I don't have experience to say it doesn't work or anything. But uh, all I know out of my experience is that it not as you know of course it looks. It's not like saying you know I do it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, it does not that. I think it does uh, play a large. Uh, part in your in your success surgeries, yeah. So that's the point I want to make, yeah. So let us make a, we're coming to a, a last point. Uh, symptomatic bicompartmental bone on bone disease. There's only one answer. Is it no role for X-ray therapy, no role for injections, no role for a uni, no role for HTO, no role for stem cell, no role for a PFO. There's role only for a PKR. I think we all accept that. But I want yeah. to make this message very clear. That is, yeah. stem cell therapy, a lot of people are doing it for this uh, advanced disease. It just doesn't work. So this is, uh, I'd like to end by this uh, slide. Uh, this patient, uh, you can see that has had a, a proximal fibular osteotomy done from the left side. Uh, I can excuse the surgeon if he wow. did for high compartment OA, but it's done for uh, inflammatory arthritis. Inflammatory yeah. arthritis. So this is really, um, what shall I say? Not a good idea. Not, not acceptable in any, any yard yeah, Can I ask you one question? Yes, please. Your uni seem to be doing fantastic. Can I just ask you one question? How long yes. does it last compared to you care, um, T care? Just give it the one answer. Not how well your patient is. How long does it last? Not the same. Not the same uh, time. Don't agree. Time. Don't agree. That's not what the data says. Maybe in your hands. It's yes. just like your avian. Just like your avian. In, uh, I think you ought to be a bit careful. Throwing uni in every damn thing. And I think you ought to look at the telephone joint too. So I think there is, you've got to be a bit moderate. You just can't just push uni in every AMOA alone. No, no, we are certainly not pushing, uh, uh, Jack. We are certainly not pushing. I think the indications are getting more and more very clear. Uh, when, when it works, when it doesn't work, how to do it, technique-wise, everything. Uh, people like Sachin have got, you know, as I said, 17, 20 year results. So uh, we are not pushing in every patient. But we now... But longevity isn't a problem. Longevity isn't a problem compared to... Longevity on that point, on that... Yeah. Uh, there are many uh, variables, uh, uh, Jacob. Jacob like, you know, uh, like one, it, one uh, big point. Yeah, yeah, Sharon. Sharon, you're not no, audible. The main difference, which we, we keep talking about this, a uh, HTO, we have, yeah, I'm not audible. Uh, HTO, when we do, we know that it progresses over a period of time. Is that right? But AMO and uh, UNIs are considered a solution, not a stopgap. That's what the Oxford people say. That's How correct, many yeah. people agree and disagree with that? Yeah. Agree strongly on that. They agree strongly on that. So uh, there, are, there is enough evidence to prove that the revision of HTO to TKR, uh, the results are much better than uh, revising a UNI to a TKR. There is enough evidence in literature on that. Controversial, I would think. Uh, that statement is controversial. No, I don't think uh, I, I can prove it as enough in literature. I have researched on it. And it is the conclusion is that the revision of a HTO to a TKR, if you do a medial open wedge osteotomy, is uh, the results are much better than revising a no, UTI. I think it yeah, so best many... to say that, you know, uh, how an HTO has been done before, what implant has been used. Uh, definitely what a unit does is uh, unit takes off more bone. So already you're cutting bone in an HTO, the bone is preserved. So that's one of the disadvantages, you know, converting and so uni. There are many confounding uh, variables here. Can I come in? Yeah. So the, uh, the so what we can do is we can come important. again another day and talk only about unis and. You yeah, know, I think we should do that. I think we should do that. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be another three hour session, sir. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good note to end the session, I think. Uh, Parag, you can have the last uh, concluding remark. Yeah, so, so there are a couple of quick questions which have come. Uh, so, regarding unis, uh, Vijay, the question is, what do you prefer, a fixed bearing or do you prefer uh, a mobile bearing uni? Uh, 
I used to do use mobile bearing; it worked well. But we are now more on the fixed bearing, where I think the indicators are even more than a mobile bearing. Okay. Okay. Why? 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 Why did you move? Well, to robot. be honest, one of the reasons was uh, the robotic that we got uh, seemed to take take do only the fixed bearing. So for various reasons, we had to. Uh, some of them are totally not scientific. We had to move on to uh, fixed bearing, but that seems to work very well as well. So uh, another well, question is. Uh, uh, one of the earlier slides which you showed uh, we always see this chondromalacia so what is the treatment for chondromalacia you know the medical management for chondromalacia what medical what medicines work in chondromalacia well i think the uh, the injections and things are the same as the uh, as the knee oa but the exercise program is completely different uh, we do exercises for uh, knee oa would uh, aggravate patellar femoral oa i would think and uh, and the arthroscopic procedures are more amenable as clement was saying uh, than knee oa more role in uh, patellar femoral oa i would think yeah uh, yes vikash yeah i think for uh, patellar femoral oa the primary treatment initially would be the itb and the lateral compartment uh, physiotherapy is your mic is your mic please Mike. I don't know what's happening today. I think there's something wrong. It's hey, less less alcohol inside you. Uh, no, it's uh, you've taken away all of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, uh, can you hear me now? Now very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now, uh, first of all, of course, it would be uh, non-invasive ITB uh, stretches, and as you said, a different set of exercises. And uh, if it uh, does not work. then i would again uh, try to do a non invasive investigation like uh, special x ray views sky lines and if needed an mri also to quantify the problem in patellofemoral joint and then accordingly intervene as it, if it is required arthroscopically sachin sachin you want to tell how you would manage uh, early much, patellofemoral oa so i think that is another 3 hour session in itself uh, <laughs> predominantly the pathoetiology of chondromalacia patelli is biomechanical as well as neural so i think uh, parag let's have uh, anti the knee pain as a different it's webinar perfect. so that we can ha have more highlights on that and perhaps we can all of physical therapist also so agreed agreed uh, let's keep that aside yeah. if you don't so mind one quick be last question idea. before we end uh, the question is that uh, concomitant osteoporosis osteomalacia with osteoarthritis what's the line of treatment that's one question which has come up anybody just like metabolic issues uh, they have to be uh, quantified and they have to be treated uh, they don't have a direct bearing on uh, you know what all we discussed but those have to be identified coexistent diseases uh, which go to bone metabolism have to be treated yeah they yeah, cannot so be concomitantly you can treat because you know a patient who is uh, osteoarthritic can have osteomalacia or osteoporosis so you need absolutely to absolutely treat them concomitantly uh, and simultaneously and uh, some of them the knee pain may go away yeah. so i don't jump and do any operative intervention yeah absolutely so i think there are more questions but we have run out of time i want to thank vijay for an excellent presentation you know you brought about so many points it's like 1 hour 35 minutes we've been at it but really uh, enjoyed every moment of it well done vijay i want to uh, yeah. thank thanks for yeah. thanks all the all the panelists who are here Mukesh, Clement, uh, Bhushan, Kanchan, Raju, Jacob, Vikas, Adarsh, uh, Ashish, Alankar, really great. You know, you guys have done really wonderful. You know, all this is not possible without Ashok, without Sachin's help. So you know, Ashok, you have really done uh, very well, and to you know bring out this kind of uh, activity in the days where we are forced to be at home is is enjoyable. And uh, thanks, Ashok. And some people in Goa. is <laughs> <laughs> right there behind what's happening you're in different part of the world why <laughs> green Hawaii. screen or yeah so, huh? so ashok tells me again we had 1600 plus viewers so yeah more than that more than that that's excellent so good uh, thank you so much tomorrow we very will well. at the same time 7 pm is going to be a very interesting uh, uh, round table webinar tomorrow and sachin is going to take us through uh, the acl deficient knees or what is the current trends of management of uh, acl tears what is in what is out and yeah. the controversies in that and acl is like it's going to be very difficult for him to you know finish it in 90 minutes but i'm sure 
knowing Sachin, he'll do a great job. Sachin, we look forward to it tomorrow. And Sachin, you also do you want to announce uh, on Saturday? Sachin is doing some activity through PKC. So Sachin, very quickly on that. So Saturday we'll have another webinar around uh, seven or seven thirty. Ashok, I forgot. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, and uh, it will be uh, activity webinar on the revision ACL reconstruction. And the panelists uh, will be uh, Dr. Andy Williams from London. There'll be um, uh, Dr. Dinsha Pardiwala and myself. So uh, uh, please uh, be there for the webinar. Please share it amongst your colleagues as well. So it will be a nice uh, way to sort of interact and uh, try and uh, bash out all these uh, uh, difficult topics as what we're doing right now. Great. So this will be on Saturday. So this will uh, uh, we will tell you more about it. But uh, for now, thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciate uh, the involvement. And Sachin, we are looking forward to tomorrow, 7 p.m. Absolutely. For the ACL Absolutely. management, ACL test. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank all the panelists. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow, 7 o'clock.